Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Sami Figueredo. I am anesthetist and intensivist in a BCS hospital uh, in Paris, France. It is my pleasure to be the moderator of this session uh, dedicated on war trauma and specifically uh, dedicated to uh, chemical, biological, nuclear and radiological weapons. Uh, it is my pleasure to uh, be a moderator uh, together with Jacques Duranto. Uh, maybe you, you want uh, Jacques to, to say a few words to our attendees, uh, yes, it's a, the a Europe and the world maybe. Yes, it's a great pleasure to be with you and uh, to co-chair uh, this uh, session. Uh, and it's uh, great uh, to be uh, with a uh, colleague from Ukraine and uh, to uh, support uh, them uh, through this uh, webinar. And uh, so uh, a great pleasure to be with you. Thank you, Jacques. Um, so the, for this uh, webinar, uh, we should have two topics um, uh, with two experts. Uh, unfortunately, our colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Corini, um, cannot attend this uh, webinar. Uh, we wish her a quick uh, recover uh, because she had today um, uh, uh, a problem, so we, uh, we hope that uh, everything is going to, uh, to be well for her. Um, and we have our uh, expert for this webinar, who is uh, Dr. Andrew Johnson. Uh, good afternoon, Andrew. Uh, good afternoon, Sammy and Jack and uh, colleagues around the world. It is my pleasure uh, to introduce you. So, uh, Andrew uh, Justin is a UK military head of uh, intensive care medicine and a lieutenant colonel in the British Army. And uh, he will have the, the hard task, but he's a, a, an expert in the field, um, to give us uh, a very uh, valuable information about uh, chemical, biological, nuclear and radiological weapons. Um, together with Jacques Duranto, we work in a civilian setting. So uh, we are maybe uh, just as uh, many attendees uh, across the world, um, totally unaware about these um, casualties and these uh, uh, clinical pictures. So uh, we will uh, listen you, uh, Andrew, with uh, uh, um, an important attention, and uh, I will take some uh, notes of uh, what you are going to say. Once again, uh, the ESIGM, and uh, um, we all want this uh, session to be very interactive, so um, don't, do not hesitate to uh, uh, ask your questions. I I'm sure you will have uh, many, many questions for Andrew. So it is my pleasure, Andrew, to um, uh, let you start uh, your talk. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much, Sammy. What I'll do first of all is I'll share my screen. Um, just make sure that you can see that. Um, you should be able to see something that says CBRN. For the moment, yes. Yeah, that's okay. okay. Good. Perfect. So. What, what I'm planning to do is to talk about chemical weapons um, and the various different chemical weapons that we worry about, um, and then talk a bit about biological agents and a bit about um, radiological and nuclear devices. I guess that the, the first thing to say is that many nations around the world have had in the past very large stockpiles of chemical agents. Um, and that includes the former Soviet Union and subsequently Russia uh, and the United States, as, as well as numerous other countries. Um, so the Russians, for example, when they were part of the Soviet Union, had something like 40,000 tonnes of chemical agent, uh, mainly comprised of sarin, soman, VX nerve agents, and then blister agents such as mustard and some, some phosgene. Um, the US had... Um, similar agents, um, including mustard and so on. Um, the um, Chemical Weapons Convention um, was ratified by Russia in 1997, and we're told um, 
and and their ins inspections to confirm this that most of their stocks or possibly all of their stocks have now been destroyed um, and the same for the u.s stocks of chemical agents um, and there's a picture of some of the u.s mustard uh, shells in the u.s repository um, some of the U.S. repositories of chemical agents have completely destroyed their, all of the agents that they held. Um, and at some point in the next couple of years, it's likely that all of the Cold War stockpiles of chemical agents will have been destroyed. Um, it takes a very long time to destroy these agents because they're often packed into shells that contain explosive charges. And so destruction of them is a laborious and complicated process. Um, usually the agents are destroyed either by incineration or by hydrolysis at high temperatures. Chemical agents were extensively used, um, starting off in the First World War by lots of different armies. Um, this is a picture of Italian soldiers killed by Austrian army shells filled with chlorine or phosgene at the Battle of Caporetto in 1917. Um, and the uh, Italians in this, in this battle suffered about 40,000 fatalities. One of the interesting things is that the um, fatality rate for chemical weapons is actually quite low. So in the First World War, around about 1.3 million people were exposed to chemical weapons. But the um, death rate from them was, was relatively low, around about 100,000 people dying. So somewhere less than 10% of people exposed to chemical weapons died from them. Um, although, of course, there, was, there were legacy effects of ill health, including lung problems after exposure to things like mustard agent. And of course, like many weapons, the people that suffered the most in war uh, in the First World War were civilians, because within a fairly short period of time, military, military populations would have protective equipment like gas masks, um, and that applied to a lesser extent to civilian populations. And then since the First World War, chemical agent use has continued, although they weren't used in the Second World War, um, they were extensively used in the Iran-Iraq war, predominantly by the um, forces of Saddam Hussein against the Iranians, um, with some of the precursors of these weapons being supplied by various European nations. Um, the Iraqis used the chemical weapons initially using riot control agents to negate the numerical superiority of the Iranian forces. Um, and then they used mustard and nerve agents with around about 20,000 fatalities from these chemical weapons and potentially as many as 34,000 veterans in Iran with chronic ill health effects, including things like bronchiolitis obliterans attributed to mustard agent. Um, although the Iranians had a lot of experience in treating nerve agent in particular, the publications on the... Um, treatment algorithms and so on in the English language, English language literature are relatively sparse. Chemical agent use then continued by the Saddam Hussein regime, and in particular, um, he used various chemical agents against uh, the civilian population, uh, and in, uh, particularly notably awful uh, episode at Halabja in uh, 1988, um, where he killed some, something between 7,000 and 10,000 people. And that's very well documented. Um, again, not much written on the medical side about the treatment of these um, patients because I don't think there was much treatment available. Um, those are all examples of the use of chemical agents by states or countries against other countries, but chemical agents have also been used by uh, terrorist organizations and the the most notable um, release was when sarin was released on the Tokyo subway in 1995, with a relatively small number of fatalities. And if I remember rightly, about about 12 people died, um, but with uh, quite severe poisoning of 50 patients and about a thousand patients with some effect from sarin exposure, and uh, many thousands of people attending hospital immediately afterwards. Um, what this illustrates really is that these chemical agents are relatively um, easy to make and it's unlikely someone would make them in, in their garage but if, if you've got somebody with chemical expertise and enough money it is possible for organized well organized terrorist organizations to make chemical agents and use them um, Many of the things that we see in our normal jobs in intensive care in terms of the kinds of poisonings that we see 
um, have typical toxic dromes. And if you think about um, patients you've seen with tricyclic antidepressant poisoning, they have a very characteristic toxidrome. So what we think about when we're seeing patients who've been poisoned by nerve agents is the particular to toxidrome that they get. Um, and that tends to manifest as um, uh, basically a combination of biosis, uh, bradycardia, bronchospasm, secretions, seizures, paralysis, and death. And you'll remember that nerve agents work by binding to acetylcholinesterase, which is the enzyme that breaks down acetyl acetylcholine and inactivates it. And acetylcholine then builds up at the receptors in the CNS and at muscarinic and nicotinic receptors. And then with time, the bond between the nerve agent and the enzyme strengthens in a process called aging. So in the military setting, what would happen is that if we're expecting a chemical warfare attack, and nerve agent in particular, soldiers carry um, combi pens, which are auto-injectors containing the antidote to nerve agents, specifically praladoxime or another oxime, along with atropine, and in some of the auto-injectors, uh, diazepam or a similar drug. Um, in the civilian setting, uh, the equivalent poisoning is organophosphorus um, insecticide, organophosphate insecticide poisoning. And we almost never see that in Europe. Um, it's quite difficult for people to buy organophosphate insecticides over the counter um, in most of Europe due to health and safety legislation. Um, but colleagues who've trained in other parts of the world or worked in Africa or South Asia will have seen patients who've taken organophosphorus insecticide. Um, in meta-analyses of patients with insecticide poisoning, oxymes don't seem to work. And that's probably because um, insecticide poisoning is different. The insecticide is dissolved in things that are cardiotoxic, like um, organic solvents, such as toluene. Um, and there's often a very marked delay in uh, civilian poisoning patients getting to the hospital. So in a setting where you're expecting a nerve agent attack, like a military setting, um, administration of oxygens are thought likely to work. And there is animal, animal work that suggests that that is the case. And if the oxygen is given soon enough, it will reverse um, or re seriously reduce the severity of the nerve agent poisoning. Um, one of the very characteristic features of nerve agent poisoning is widespread fasciculation. And this is a, a veterinary poisoning. Um, you can see this dog has, has fasciculation across all of its muscles. Um, it's quite difficult to get used to the idea of treating something that you're probably never going to see in civilian practice. Um, and there are very few videos showing human subjects who've been poisoned, um, at least partly because it's quite difficult to get consent from people. Um, there are a few videos, and I think I've probably got one here. So this is, this is um, one that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine um, with permission from the author. And this is a child who's ingested um, uh, insecticide. Um, you can see that he's got tongue fasciculation. Um, so these widespread fasciculations are, are something that's pretty characteristic of nerve agent poisoning and something you don't see in, in other conditions. Um, I think the only time you see something like that would be in someone who's been given succinamethonium and it's very transient. And this is the same patient after treatment where the fasciculation has settled down. Suburb of uh, Kafar Batna uh, shows a bearded man convulsing on the ground. This is a quick video clip, video number eight. A uh, shot outside Mu'adamiya, outside Damascus, appears to show a man frothing uh, at the mouth. Uh, again, the intelligence committee, the senators, were told by the intelligence community that these have been verified, and they show the symptoms of a chemical weapons attack. Video number nine of the 13 shown to members of the Senate. So I'm sorry to show you some distressing videos without a warning there, but the... the um... Those are the only videos I could find in the, they're more or less in the public domain of, of actual poisoning with, with nerve agents. Um, the foaming at the mouth does seem to be something that's seen in patients with um, insecticide ingestion as well. And you could see that one of the patients there was fitting, um, unconscious, etc. Um, 
So a fairly characteristic toxidrome, not something you'd expect to see in the usual poisons we'd see in civilian practice. And of course, there are things in the context of patients arriving that will give you the, uh, the idea that this is, is nerve agent poisoning. So for example, um, in the Tokyo subway attack, they had a very large number of patients with the same symptoms. And that's not something you'd expect to see um, unless there's been a deliberate release of an agent. Um, so in terms of the practicalities of treating nerve agent poisoning, um, the first thing that should happen before the patient gets to hospital is that they should have their clothing removed um, because a lot of these agents are um, fairly volatile. So sarin has a, um, a similar consistency to petrol. So it's something where the vapor will kind of cling to people's clothing, but it will evaporate reasonably quickly, um, particularly in warm weather or if it's windy. Um, so decontamination by removal of clothing will remove about 90% of most chemical agents with a few exceptions. Um, patients should not have too much treatment in the um, danger area around where they've been exposed. We'd call that the, the hot zone. Um, but they should, they should have life-saving interventions if required. Um, and those might include interventions to stop bleeding if the chemical agent's been released um, by an explosion and the, the patients also have conventional um, injuries like ballistic trauma. Um, but then patients essentially should be given oxine to reactivate their acetylcholinesterase, atropine to counter the muscarinic effects of the agent, um, potentially with very high doses. Um, so if you think about the maximum dose of atropine that you might give someone who's had a cardiac arrest and is bradycardic or is an asystole, um, you're potentially going to give them maybe one milligrams, maybe three milligrams. In nerve agent poisoning, you're potentially going to require 10 to 20 milligrams per patient in the first few hours after exposure. And some patients require up to 50 milligrams of atropine in the first 24 hours. And that's got very obvious implications for um, planning for chemical agent attack um, in terms of the amount of medications like atropine that you need in the hospital. Um, notably, atropine won't reverse the, um, the pupillary constriction that patients get with nerve agent poisoning. Um, uh, and the other thing that patients may need is they may need, some, may need some benzodiazepine treatment because of the central nervous system effects of nerve agent. Um, and uh, that those include confusion um, and then more severe effects like seizures. In terms of diagnostics, uh, blood samples can be taken for plasma or red cell cholinesterase activity, which will give you a fairly convincing answer as to um, what's happened to the patient. Uh, I won't go into what you need for forensic considerations and like to, pr to prove exactly what happened. That's a bit more complicated. Um, this is a picture of the number of atropine vials you have to open if you've only got 0.5 milligram per mil atropine available in your hospital. And this again points to having plans to have multi-dose um, 50 milligram atropine vials available or something similar. Um, so really summary of nerve agent treatment, decontamination, the antidote, which is praladoxime or a similar oxime, atropine, which is given until the patient is no longer bradycardic. Um, nerve agent makes them very bright, bradycardic and you'd expect that um, one of the signs you've given enough atropine is that the heart rate has come up over about 90. Um, and then the other thing to do is to try and reduce the amount of secretions. And in the developing world, um, what people do is they keep giving atropine until a gloved hand in the patient's armpit no longer comes out covered in sweat and until the respiratory secretions have dried up. And then benzodiazepines as required to control seizures. Um, if someone's severely poisoned, they may well need to go to the intensive care unit. Um, and you can see that if a lot of patients have been poisoned at once, you could suddenly find that you are struggling to have enough ventilators or enough intensive care beds available. Um, that's another reason for being keen on the use of oxymes and in the animal models giving an oxime early reduces the duration that the um, animal is incapacitated for and potentially would reduce the length of stay required on intensive care. Um, for some of the more recently used agents like the um, Novichok agents, um, the patients that have been um, described um, particularly in the UK, have required quite long lengths of stay in intensive care. Um, 
um, whether that's because of delayed recognition of what the agent was or um, specific characteristics of the agent and its absorption isn't entirely clear, but I suspect it's the latter. We'll move on to chlorine. Um, chlorine is a widely available gas. Um, it's used in light industry. Um, it, it's not banned by chemical weapons conventions in, in that it, it's, it's ubiquitous in industry. Um, it's used for all manner of different chemical processes, and it's usually reasonably easy to get hold of. And chlorine gas has been used both in um, attacks on markets in the Middle East where industrial chlorine cylinders have been blown up, but also it's been used in Syria um, and the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons have confirmed this, although they don't describe responsibility for or say who has used it. Um, everyone's familiar with the smell of chlorine from the swimming pool. It's got a very characteristic, characteristic yellowy green um, color. Uh, and in military use in the Middle East recently, it's been delivered in barrel bombs, which are essentially a cylinder of chlorine with a small explosive charge that are then dropped from the air onto civilian uh, targets. Um, te they tend not to cause a huge amount of fatalities, but they're very much a weapon of terror. Um, uh, chlorine uh, disperses very quickly, particularly in uh, warm environments and if it's windy. It is heavier than air, though, so it will pool in um, underground areas where people are sheltering, like in bomb shelters and people's basements and so on. Um, and the mechanism of um, damage from chlorine is predominantly that it dissolves in body fluids and forms hydrochloric and hypochlorous acid. So the uh, damage that it causes is predominantly to the airways. So you get eye irritation and um, damage, but then quite significant pneumonitis. Um, and the experience um, in the medical literature from, from chlorine is predominantly from industrial exposures um, where patients get um, acute breathlessness, chest discomfort, cough, eye irritation, and so on. Um, and in extreme uh, exposures, they get an ARDS-like injury. Uh, it's not entirely clear what, whether there's any specific treatment for this. Most likely it's supportive care with some suggestion that things like steroids might help, but not much actual evidence that that might be the case. Um, so generally for chlorine, the treatment would be uh, removal from exposure and supportive care. Um, next, the next class of chemical agents is vesicants or blister agents like mustard. Um, mustard's the kind of original um, manufactured chemical agent that has a characteristic smell of garlic or horseradish. Um, and what it does is it causes a kind of delayed um, irritant effect uh, on the skin and any moist surfaces like uh, mucosa, eyes, uh, and areas that are, are sweaty, like armpits, groins, etc. Um, and patients who are exposed to mustard have a, a, delayed, a delayed effect of basically anything ranging from mild erythema through to full-on huge blister formation. Um, it, um, there's a picture of the blisters. In so the blisters basically, in, in more severe exposure, are, have a similar effect to, to thermal burns. Um, they, they can be full thickness um, and... If enough body surface area is affected, it will have a similar effect to burns in terms of fluid shifts and inflammation and so on. Um, the treatment is very similar to that of thermal burns and depending on body surface area exposed uh, and the severity of the exposure. Um, mustard is available. There are legacy munitions around them. There's, there's uh, old artillery shells from the First World War and from people's or various countries' stockpiles that are sometimes found in various parts of the world, including the Middle East. In the, um, in the West, the mustard exposure has mainly been seen in weapons decommissioning accidents, or in the UK, we sometimes get old mustard shells from the First World War washed up on the beach in various parts of the country after the storms, and people can get exposed to it that way. Um, in the severe mustard exposure, because mustard is an alkylating agent, you would expect that you're probably going to get some um, 
some bone marrow suppression a few weeks after exposure as well. And obviously, if a patient has got a big exposure, that would potentially complicate their recovery if they're requiring things like skin grafting and so on. Um, in most patients, the um, certainly less severely exposed, the blisters will settle down and, and the patient will heal up and the patient with eye exposure will get recovery. This is a historical picture from the First World War of someone who's had quite severe mustard expo exposure during the recovery phase. And you can see that his skin is mostly um, healing up reasonably well. Um, in terms of managing mustard, the key things are rapid de decontamination. Um, it has to be very rapid though because the uh, mustard is fixed into the skin within a couple of minutes um, but potentially removing it contaminated clothing and um, showering or, or kind of uh, dousing the affected area with water to remove some or all of the of the mustard um, there are a very long list of other potential chemical agents and some of those are um, things that have been specifically designed uh, as chemical agents. So um, things like lewisite um, and others are chemicals that are used in industry in many different forms, including things like um, hydrogen cyanide, phosgene, um, etc. cetera. Um, and some of these are what, what are called agents of opportunity, where if um, a terrorist organization um, can... Uh, steal some of these agents from uh, an industrial site, they potentially could release them in a populated area. Um, the other possibility is that during armed conflict, when there's bombing of cities and so on, uh, people can uh, destroy chemical factories either accidentally or deliberately with release of these chemicals into the surrounding area or fires in areas where they're stored, releasing them into the surrounding area. Um, the um, I mean, so many of these things are things that people train for anyway. Our, our local fire services um, and hazardous response agencies know where these things are stored and have plans for dealing with fires at large industrial sites and so on. Um, but clearly, in wartime, that can be a lot more difficult. Um, in terms of the agents that have specific antidotes, so nerve agent, you've got a very characteristic toxidrome, and therefore you should know to give atropine and um, oxymes. Uh, for some of the other agents, the fire service and uh, other agencies may have sensors that will tell you exactly which agent is being used. Um, response agencies often can bring things like mass spectrometry to the site um, to identify what's going on. Um, and for some of them, it's just supportive care. So things that cause lung damage, like um, potentially mustard, chlorine, phosgene, there isn't a specific antidote, but there are, uh, well, well we're, we're all very used to dealing with people with respiratory failure and providing supportive care. There's a lot of unknowns, and although there's been a lot of um, predominantly military-funded research into many of these agents over the last uh, 40 years or so, we still don't know certain things. So for example, if someone has severe ARDS caused by chlorine, would putting them on ECMO help or not? I don't think we know that. And uh, there aren't any animal models of it as far as I'm aware up until now. Um, in terms of responding to these kinds of agents, the um, specific response depends to some extent on the agent suspected, although also, there's a kind of generic response to many of them. Um, in terms of your own institutions, you, you need to think about these agents in your major incident plan. So we plan for all different kinds of eventualities, often focusing on incidents where there's lots of trauma. But actually, we should think about these things as well, and um, not just from the point of view of deliberate nerve agent release, but also um, from other toxic industrial chemicals. Um, decontamination for most of these agents is very straightforward. It involves removing the casualties' clothing and then showering. Um, I'll talk about biological and radiological uh, agents later on, um, but maybe a little bit more about decontamination. Um, so in 
in exposures where some of the agent remains on the patient, they are potentially going to be a risk to medical staff. And this particularly applies to things like nerve agents. Um, so in the Tokyo subway attacks, uh, many patients made their own way to hospital because the attacks were right in the middle of the city. Uh, and we, this is something that we see in many kinds of incidents, including mass shootings and bombings and so on. But actually, if the attack is in a city, in a stadium or um, uh, somewhere else like that, the casualties will make their own way to hospital and, and arrive in the emergency department potentially before the medical staff know there's been an incident. And in Tokyo, what happened is that some of the patients who came into the hospital still had residual sarin vapor on their clothing. And that was then um, at high enough concentrations to cause medical staff to get um, uh, pupillary constriction and be unable to perform very well because they couldn't see properly. Um, so simply removing someone's clothing will get rid of 90% of the contamination. And that applies to nearly all uh, agents. Um, the other thing, of course, is that when there is an incident, you should be shutting your emergency department and not letting patients in until someone's had a look at them and worked out what's going on, whether there is a threat to staff and whether patients need to be decontaminated before being allowed into the hospital. Um, in the NHS, uh, in the UK, we use wet decontamination. And that's what most people use uh, in various places around the world. Wet decontamination usually uses pop-up shower facilities run by the ambulance service or the fire service or by the hospital themselves, um, where the patient's asked to disrobe and is showered down with warm water. Um, and uh, in the UK, we use warm soapy water in the civilian sector. Uh, and then basically that will remove nearly all of the contamination and soap or dilute chlorine bleach will chemically denature many chemical and biological agents as well. Um, wet decontamination uh, is also used in some military settings um, and for patients who are unable to walk they would come through the, the facility on stretchers or on the kind of conveyor belt where they'd have their clothes cut off and then be showered, uh, have immediate life um, saving interventions like control of catastrophic hemorrhage, administration of antidotes, uh, airway adjuncts. And then once they're clean, um, they would be then passed over to a clean area of the facility to have a proper medical review um, and consideration of whether they need any more treatment and re-triage to see what their priority for transport to a hospital would be. Um, the other form of decontamination that's used in the military is dry decontamination using a particular kind of clay. Uh, it's a powdered clay called fuller's earth that will adsorb uh, most chemicals. So patients are cut out of their um, anti-chemical warfare suits and um, or out of their clothing and then kind of dabbed down with uh, powdered clay to absorb any of the um, agent that was left. Um, at the same time, they'd have life-saving interventions in the um, area where they're being decontaminated before being transferred on for uh, ongoing treatment. Um, and in terms of life-saving interventions, it really is the kind of minimum that we would do in this setting. So it literally is stopping people from bleeding to death by putting on tourniquets or packing wounds with hemostatic dressings, um, administering antidotes and protecting the airway. Um, in the military setting, what we do is we use intraosseous access um, because of the difficulties of trying to get intra, um, to get a cannula into a vein um, whilst wearing uh, gloves and a respirator. Um, and we typically go for sternal intraosseous access or possibly humeral intraosseous access. Um, and we can administer the required antidotes through um, a sternal intraosseous needle. Um, click through a couple of those. In terms of getting information about managing chemical chemical agents, um, most agencies in um, pretty much every country. So, so basically, your local public health um, agency um, or the Centers for Disease Control or equivalent publish um, regularly updated uh, guidelines on managing CBR incidents. Um, there was a supplement to critical care medicine in 2005, which is still probably up to date enough to use, um, but there'll be more up-to-date stuff published locally. Um, what I was going to do now is move on 
briefly to biological and radiological, and then perhaps we'll, we'll have a talk about, um, about agents. Um, the biological agents fall into two categories. Um, so the first is microorganisms. So this would be bacteria, um, often including unusual diseases such as anthrax or tularemia that we don't see very often in most parts of Europe. Um, and the particular thing about biological agents is that in the past, countries who had active biological warfare programs um, would uh, basically work on the bacteria that they were going to use to make them antibiotic resistant. Um, so if you're if you start seeing um, outbreaks of unusual organisms, particularly if it's in a conflict zone or a time of um, high political um, strain, it may, be, it may be that it's um, relevant and it may be a biological agent release. Um, biological agents are within the um, abilities of terrorist organisations to make. Um, and the um, Japanese cult who released sarin on the Tokyo subway had also um, had an active biological warfare program. Um, and there's various other people around the world who've um, stated that they would like to make biological warfare agents, including um, white supremacists and various others. Um, there's also the possibility of the use of viruses, and the classical one would be smallpox. Um, obviously, if you were to see a smallpox outbreak now, it would be very suspicious because smallpox has been eradicated since the, the late 1970s. Um, and other, other agents that might be considered are Ebola um, and um, the, the various um, equine hemorrhagic fever type viruses. Um, the these agents, I mean, I think from a point of the point of view of intensive care, we're used to dealing with biological agents in, in that we are used to dealing with things like sepsis and severe infection. Um, so I think critical care for these is going to be very similar to what we do on a day-to-day -day basis for our normal patients. It's just that you might suddenly find you have to deal with a lot more of them, or you may find that the antibiotics that you're planning to use don't work. I think nowadays it would be um, it's likely that we'll know very quickly if um, an agent that we start seeing is um, man-made, um, and there's various ways of people being able to tell. We we, we can get uh, bacterial samples um, sequenced very quickly now using their 16S uh, ribosomal sequence and other others as well. Um, so I think the likelihood of this being a useful agent in terms of military targets and so on is very low now, um, but it would still be um, very upsetting and perhaps terrifying for civilian populations if this were used against them. The biological toxins, um, are things like ricin, and there's a whole list of them, but, but ricin in particular is, um, is very popular just now with um, extremists and other people, um, at least in part because of its appearance in a popular American TV program, Baking, Breaking Bad. Um, so there's lots of cases in the US just now of people being prosecuted for making ricin at home and sending it through the post to um, their favourite president. Um, the... These the ricin toxin is basically made from castor beans. Um, it is uh, it basically stops protein synthesis, um, so it affects the rapidly turning over cells very quickly, particularly uh, gut cells and others, and causes a really severe SIRS, um, progressing to kind of sepsis-like syndrome with shock and multi-organ multi failure. Treatment of it is supportive. Um, there are a whole load of other biological toxins. Um, some of them are things that we think about anyway in intensive care, like botulinum toxin. Um, others are weird and wonderful things from um, shellfish like saxitoxin or staphylococcal toxins, which are um, theoretically at least easy to make in large quantities um, uh, by growing up bacteria in vats and extracting the toxins. Um, so that's toxins, and we we'll perhaps talk about that a bit more later on. Um, I'll move on briefly to radiation. Radiation is quite difficult because we we don't really tend to see people with radiation poisoning or radiation syndromes in critical care um, outside of very specialised centres. Um, 
there are about three different things that we worry about in um, CBRN. So the first one is the exposure of someone to a point source. So this would be um, <clears throat> getting an unshielded uh, radiological source that might be used for um, radiation therapy or industrial radiography, and then placing it somewhere where it will expose an individual or various people passing by to a high level of um, usually gamma radiation. Um, these have been used um, in the past um, to for kind of targeted assassinations. And then there are quite a few cases where people have um, picked up discarded radiotherapy or radiation sources and got localized burns or, or fairly severe um, radiation syndromes of various kinds. They're not really the kind of thing you expect to see in, in a war. Um, what might be more likely is something called a radiologic dispersal device. This would be a uh, sorry, an improvised bomb, which would be used to disperse a highly radioactive substance. Um, so this would be maybe steal a radiotherapy source from a hospital um, and place a bomb on it and then blow it up in a place where there's lots of people. And the biggest risk to people who are injured from these kind of weapons is probably conventional ballistic injuries from the explosive blast uh, and fragment injuries. Um, casualties who are exposed to these kind of devices may have surface contamination with radioactive, radioactive material in terms of dust and so on, or may have radioactive material in their wounds. This is very easy to detect with radiation detectors, and most contamination can be easily identified and removed with conventional decontamination, so removing their clothes and um, then showering. Um, if someone has got wound contamination, um, basically treating the injuries as you would any other injuries takes priority over worrying about the radiation because the risk of radiation to anyone treating the patient is likely to be extremely low. Um, and the good thing about radiation is you can tell where it is using radiation detectors of various kinds. Um, what a radiological dispersal device will do is it will potentially contaminate the area where it's been exploded um, and require a very expensive and prolonged cleanup. But the risk of serious radiation poisoning and casualties is likely to be very low. Um, the next thing we worry about is uh, deliberate or accidental damage to a nuclear reactor. Um, and we were worried about this a few weeks ago, I think, um, in Eastern Europe, where there was bombing and, and um, fighting going on near the Chernobyl site. Um, the uh, risk of damage to a nuclear reactor potentially is the risk that the nuclear reactor will um, not be able to be shut down safely and may um, end up uh, having an explosion or a fire releasing radioisotopes into the environment um, in a long plume spreading out um, a long distance depending on what the, the weather's like. Um, and then there's also the risk of injuries to first responders at the scene, um, especially if there's fire, etc. But it's um, similar in some ways to what happened during the Chernobyl reactor um, accident. Um, and then finally, um, we worry about um, nuclear explosions. It's, it's kind of arguable how much of a role critical care has to play if there's an actual nuclear explosion. The nuclear explosion could be an improvised nuclear device where um, a terrorist organization or others have made their own small nuclear bomb, um, or it could be a state uh, using a, a tactical nuclear weapon. Um, and a small, a small, even a very small tactical nuclear weapon, so 10 kilotons, so it's the equivalent of 10,000 tons of TNT, um, would potentially cause somewhere between 100,000 and a million deaths, depending on how, um, depending on the population density of the city in which it's exploded or the area in which it's exploded. Um, so you're potentially going to get 100,000 deaths and then 100,000 casualties. And I think realistically, um, it's going to be very unlikely that you'd be providing any critical care in that setting, um, not least because the likelihood is that if this bomb went off in a city, it would destroy the hospitals in the centre of the city near where it was, um, and any medical staff in other hospitals would be dealing with uh, casualties um, with conventional injuries. Um, there are, at least in theory, a group of patients exposed to radiation and trauma who would be salvageable with things like um, stem cell treatments, stem cell transplantation, 
et cetera, et cetera, but whether in reality there would be enough capacity in the health system to deliver critical care to those patients is, is very much debatable. Um, and in the larger um, explosion of strategic nuclear war, there'll be no role for critical care. Um, the other thing to say is that um, in so there's, a, there's, there's there's several different parts to a nuclear explosion. The first thing is that very close to the explosion, there's quite a lot of radiation. Um, but in most um, of these types of bombs, anyone who's close enough to the epicenter to be exposed to the radiation that the bomb produces will be killed by the blast effects and the thermal effects. Um, so those people are not going to be um, presenting to ICU with radiation poisoning a couple of weeks later because they, they'll be dead. Um, and then there's other issues around fallout and contamination and so on. Um, it's just another, another picture of something similar. Um, so this is a 10 kiloton device. It's going to have a, a radius of about 800 meters where everything's destroyed and then 1.6 kilometers where nearly everything's destroyed, um, where there might be some possibility of survivors being found in rubble and so on. Um, and then a, an area out to about um, five kilometers where there's a lot of um, relatively minor damage to buildings. Um, I've just about, just about finished the, this, this part of the talk. Um, what I would suggest to people who are thinking about planning for these kind of incidents and for, for injuries of war is that the National Health Service in the UK has an emergency preparedness, resilience and response aid memoir. Um, and that's available for free. And it covers many of the conventional injuries and chemical injuries um, in that aid memoir. Um, and some of it is essentially designed for use at the time that you see the patients. Um, you can look at it beforehand if you've got time, but it also tells you the key considerations when dealing with people who've been um, blown up, shot, or had chemical agent poisoning. Um, and I'll, I'll stop there, and um, shall I stop screen sharing, um, and we can have our discussion. Um, there we are. Thanks a lot, Andrew, for this uh, very uh, clear talk uh, about uh, the risk, uh, the different uh, risk uh, of uh, di with the different agent. I don't know if there is a question or comment on this. Yes, we have, uh, we have questions. Thank you uh, uh, a lot, Andrew. Uh, the first question was, uh, if a patient appears in the hospital without previous warning, and showing signs of toxidromes, what would be the minimum uh, personal protective equipment to be worn by the healthcare professionals? Um, um, you, you talked about it uh, later, but could you please uh, answer to that point? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I mean, for, for most exposures, including radiation, just universal precautions is enough. Um, I think if it's a bit more difficult with um, nerve agent because if there's a small amount of nerve agent left on the patient, um, it is possible that staff will be affected. It's unlikely they're going to get a severe poisoning from the exposure from a patient, but they may get the um, uh, meiosis, kind of pupillary uh, constriction, and that will stop people functioning properly. Um, again, it does depend to some extent on what the agent is. If it's a... Oh, a war exposure, there are agents around um, that are exceedingly toxic and that are mixed with thickening agents so that if they're on a the patient, they will stay on the patient. Um, so I guess if you do get a patient like that, your standard PPE will do a reasonable amount in protecting you, but you also need to think, why has this patient got this particular toxidrome? And um, if there's lots of other patients or there's suggestions of a major incident, you need to shut the doors of the emergency department and institute your um, mass casualty plan and make sure anyone else who comes in gets decontaminated first. Okay. Um, just uh, regarding this uh, preparation, um, 
it is difficult for uh, civilian uh, hospitals to uh, to be prepared to to these cases. Um, so uh, you showed that uh, there are uh, very specific uh, equipment, the mask, uh, and we know that. Uh, uh, even for the COVID-19 uh, pandemics, uh, mask was uh, an important issue all over the world. So uh, it was difficult to 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 have mask enough uh, for uh, everybody. So how do you how can a civilian hospital be prepared for this? Uh, uh, should there be uh, masks uh, like you showed us in every hospitals? Some uh, some hospitals um, uh, uh, dealing with this particular problem. So we generally wouldn't plan for that. I think the the key thing would be that your fire service or your first responders have um, have protective equipment um, and um, fire service breathing apparatus should protect them against this because they're breathing um, uh, cylinder cylinder air um, and there are in the, in the UK we have specific teams of um, hazardous area response uh, paramedics uh, and every region in the UK has a team like this that would do the um, treatment and initial evacuation so we wouldn't we wouldn't expect that patients would require hospital staff to wear um military grade respirators okay uh we had a, another question uh, just to um what would take the priority you told it, but uh, the question came before you uh, you covered the topic. Uh, what would take pre uh, priority, MRH or specific treatment of intoxication? So, what was the first part of the question? What would take priority, uh, MRH, the stop the bleeding, or uh, to give Hem a specific so, treatment? Yeah, hemorrhage, hemorrhage, hemorrhage always takes priority. Um, because if someone's going to bleed to death um, within two minutes, probably. Um, so so in, in the military uh, ABC algorithm, it's now CABC, where catastrophic hemorrhage takes priority over nearly everything else. Um, and we know that it, if you have a bleed from, from an artery, an artery um, junctional trauma, so femoral artery, for example, um, you're potentially going to bleed to death before you have time for airway obstruction to kill you. Yes, and you told us that we don't have that much uh, antidote, so uh, we know how to, to stop bleeding, and uh, uh, you, you perfectly told that uh, uh, it is the, the priority. Andrew, uh, uh, just um, uh, in this war, what chemical agent uh, could be used in your point of view? Um, so I think this is quite difficult to tell. I think the first thing to worry about is probably toxic industrial chemicals um, released by accident um, if a chemical factory is, is bombed. Yes. Um, and then the next possibility is deliberate attack on the chemical factory in a built-up area or near, near a population centre. Um, and then beyond that, it's difficult to know. Um, we know that um, the... Um, countries involved have signed up to the um, chemical weapons conventions and have said that they've um, got rid of, well, one of the countries involved has said that it's got rid of its um, chemical weapons stockpile. But at the same time, we are reasonably confident that they've used chemical weapons um, in various, uh, various parts of the world um, very recently. Um, and so I probably don't, I don't want to say too much about that. Um, because of the other part of my job. And it's my, my personal view is I, I, I'd be very concerned that various things might be used. And we can look at what's been used in Syria, um, um, which, which basically chlorine has been used and nerve agents have been used. Um, and I think those are probably the biggest concerns. Okay. Another question from the, the chat box. Um, it's still about preparation. <laughs> uh, so in your opinion, Andrew, uh, what should be the single most important 
ITEM to be stocked up in a general district hospital in order to be prepared for a CR, CBRN uh, incident? Uh, probably, um, probably atropine and oxines, because most of the other poisonings um, just require supportive care. Um, and there are, there are other antidotes available, but many of the other agents are very unlikely to be used. Um, cyanide poisoning is a possibility, um, but it's something that we have antidotes for. We may not have a huge amount of them. Um, and it's, you know, cyanide poisoning is something that most emergency physicians will see at some point in their career. And all of us uh, in intensive care and emergency medicine know about it and are trained to manage it. Uh, I think perhaps what's more important than stockpiling particular pharmaceuticals is making sure that everyone is trained um, to at least think about these agents so that when the patient comes through the hospital door with an odd toxidrome, someone thinks, is this, is this a chemical agent or is it something else? And if there is a, if this is a chemical agent and uh, the, the patient comes to the emergency um, uh, ward, um, uh, you talked about uh, the first thing is to remove clothes, uh, and you talked about wet decontamination, uh, decontamination or dry decontamination. Is uh, what are the benefits and the limits of uh, each option? So wet, wet decontamination is very straightforward to do, um, particularly if you've got the equipment. But I've seen um, I've seen the Norwegian fire brigade doing wet decontamination just by turning on a hose and making the patient stand under it. Um, the big disadvantage of wet decontamination um, in large parts of Europe is that it's really cold in Europe for a large part of the year, and you can convert the patient to being hypothermic very quickly. Um, so proper fire service um, or paramedic decontamination um, set up will have um, some pop-up inflatable tents with um, decontamination and some water heating for the first part of it, and then some clothing for the patient, so some paper suits or something like that for the patients to change into in a tent that's got a, a warm air heater in it um, before they're transported further. Okay. If one... Um... Uh, professional healthcare worker um, is in contact with a, a patient that uh, is finally uh, a casualty of uh, chemical weapon, for example, uh, nerve agents. Is it any preventive treatment that we can take before uh, maybe uh, the fasciculation, uh, for example, occur? Is it possible to take something in, in prevention of these um, symptoms? So there, are, so there, um, there are um, preventive agents, but they, they they have to be taken quite a while before exposure. Um, so in the military setting, where there's a high threat of um, chemical attack, something that the military personnel might take, um, so they could take pyridostigmine, for example. But in the civilian setting, it's probably not going to be all that helpful unless you have forewarning. So if you're in a situation where you're getting repeated chemical attacks, but to be honest, if the patient has been decontaminated properly, the civilian healthcare workers shouldn't have to take anything. Because um, you'd expect that your healthcare workers who are dealing with patients in the field um, will have appropriate PPE and that those in the hospital will not be exposed to any nerve agent um, because the patients will have decontaminated or been decontaminated before they get into the hospital. Obviously, that's the ideal setting. It may not always play out like that. It depends on resource and so on. Okay. Um, you said that um, how... Um, I was wondering uh, what are the possible interactions with the nerve agents and our... Uh, resuscitation drugs, uh, such as maybe um, uh, succinylcholine or um, your relaxant eye agents. Uh, yeah, you said that we had to to, to support care, but uh, how how, we, how does it interact? So um, I'm trying to remember. This is, this starts to get more complicated now. Um, I think from my recollection, um, we would probably 
So, so first of all, propofol um, and ketamine, so the two commonest agents for anesthesia are probably, or for resuscitation anesthesia, are probably okay. Um, and I think we probably would use rock um rather than succinothonium. So I, th I believe that all of those would be all right. So I think the usual things we use will still work. Okay. Simple. <laughs> um, um, you talked about uh, uh, atropine. Uh, and uh, we saw the, the amount of uh, vials, uh, empty vials. Uh, uh, what is the, the, the posology? The, uh, what, uh, uh, what, what, uh, how so much the, atropine should we yeah. give to the patient? We're potentially going to give the patient um, somewhere between two and five milligrams, and it, it depends on your local guidelines. Um, but you're going to give them a big dose, so a milligram dose, so two milligrams, five milligrams, something like that. And then if it hasn't had an effect within 15 minutes, you'd give them um, another dose. Um, some of the dosing regimes suggest you should double the dose every 15 minutes. That's what's used for some of the regimes for treating insecticide ingestion. Um, um, but the main thing is you keep giving the atropine until the uh, heart rate comes up above 90 secretions dry up um, and sweating stops. Um, but don't worry about what the pupils are doing because they won't respond in most patients to atropine. So the message is that uh, we have to, we, we can have to, uh, to use very uh, uh, high dose of atropine and uh, just uh, trying to, uh, uh, to have a response. Uh, and uh, is it just... Yes. Yes. And the other thing, the other thing I think is useful is that most most hospitals in Europe will have a resource of people who've seen a similar poisoning, which is your colleagues who've trained in Africa or India or Pakistan um, will often have seen these poisonings before, um, and you can call on them for help. Okay, uh, we have just an, uh, another question. Um, if we have a limited budget. As always, uh, should we invest uh, rather in antidotes uh, re uh, that are relatively cheap but specific for certain uh, intoxication or proper personal protective equipment, relatively expensive but works in different scenarios? Um, I think probably antidotes because the standard, standard PPE should be sufficient um, as long as your emergency department is expect or is prepared for these kind of patients and is ready to stop any of them getting into the hospital and decontaminate them appropriately. So the same PPE that, than the one we use for uh, COVID-19, except for the mask, very specific oh, mask? Um, no, just, um, not just your universal precautions, so apron, gloves, um, and um, eye protection, and then a surgical mask should be sufficient for most patients. Okay. Uh, just to talk uh, uh, once again about uh, uh, bradycardia and atropine, what if uh, despite atropine, bradycardia uh, is going worse? Um, isoprenaline, adrenaline? Uh, is I, don't, I don't think so. I think you should just give more atropine. Um, and also think about whether the diagnosis is correct. I think if you've got 10 patients with the same toxic burn, I think it's very obvious that this is this is an unusual event. If it's only one patient, then I would be thinking about um, what else might be going on. Another question was, uh, it's a, a pharmacological one. Why oxymes uh, or oxymes do not work in insecticide poisoning? So that, that's from a meta-analysis. I can't remember who published it, but um, it's probably because so what work seems to do is um, they basically free up the um, acetylcholine binding site so that it so acetylcholinesterase binding site so that it can um, chop up the um, acetylcholine. The insecticide poisonings often present very late because they're often from rural communities where it can take them four hours or six hours to get to the hospital after the poisoning. And the um, insecticides often are dissolved in things like toluene. So even if you reverse the, um, the kind of nerve agent part of the insecticide poisoning, patients can still die of cardiac toxicity from the toluene or, or other solvents. So it kind of complicates things. 
So it's probably a combination of delay and the fact that it's not just a, a nerve agent type of poisoning, but also a solvent poisoning. Okay, thank you. And what about the availability? Uh, once again, uh, in, for a civilian uh, uh, hospital of uh, oxymes, is it um, so, again uh, called by uh, pharmacist? And uh, yeah, it depends on what your national um, kind of mass casualty plans are. So in the UK, um, the National Health Service has a plan in place to be able to supply ox seems to any hospital that needs them from various repositories around the country. Um, but I don't know how things are in other parts of Europe. It's, it's usually to do with um, national disaster planning. Okay. I'm going to have a, a phone call just after this webinar for that uh, question. Um, to talk about uh, uh, chlorine, uh, you, one uh, one thing is uh, RLDS. Uh, once again, um, is it any interaction with our drugs? Uh, maybe with uh, nitric oxide, or is there any specific aspect of an RLDS uh, due to a chemical weapon such as chlorine, or or no? So I don't think that we know, and the the cases are so infrequent and they're very infrequent in Europe because of our um, very good health and safety legislation in most parts of Europe um, and the published case series of patients who've been exposed are often very small either one patient or just a few patients um, I think it's unlikely there'd be any interaction with things like nitric oxide because once once the chlorine's been inhaled it's turned to hydrochloric acid or hypochlorous acid and then it's probably being got rid of very quickly by the body uh, within minutes to hours um so i'd be surprised if there was any specific interaction i think what we don't know is whether we should do anything different from what we normally do for ards patients i suspect the answer is no we should just do what we do normally um i guess a bit like covid where um we've more or less done what we normally do and it's mostly worked <laughs> okay, and um, what is maybe the, the, the lethality of this agent when I see a patient with, a, a, I don't know, a, a nerve agent um, intoxication? Um, what is, I, I will do uh, everything to, to save him, uh, obviously, but what is the lethality of these uh, pathologies that we don't know. So I think if the patient arrives before they've had a cardiac arrest, so if they arrive at the hospital or, or have appropriate healthcare before they have a cardiac arrest, I would think that the survival is likely to be very good. Um, obviously it will be influenced by comorbidities and so on. Um, and it will depend on whether you're in a country with a mature intensive care system who can keep someone alive for as long as it takes. Um, I think in, in most of Europe, um, most patients are likely to survive if they get to hospital before they've become very hypoxic or had a cardiac arrest. Okay. Um, and and again, the acetyl, the... Sorry, acetylcholine will regenerate. So they will, um, I can't remember the exact figure, but it regenerates reasonably quickly. And it doesn't have to regenerate back to normal levels. Um, so acetylcholinesterase will regenerate. Um, it doesn't have to regenerate to normal levels. Once your acetylcholinesterase levels get up to, I think it's around 15 or 20 percent, the patient can potentially be back to almost normal. And it's a matter of uh, hours, days, weeks? They, um, potentially days. In the patient who's required um, intubation, mechanical ventilation, um, talking about a couple of days probably but again the data on that isn't there's not very good data on it to tell there are animal models but um i'm not sure how much weight you can put on them because the animals don't have the comorbidities that our civilian population have okay and is uh, uh, the cardiac arrest resuscitation different from what we usually do in a, in other settings yeah so uh, so i would um, if you have a patient who's had a cardiac arrest after a nerve agent exposure, you should be trying to get the antidotes into them quickly as well. So you'll be doing the things you normally do in terms of CPR and potentially um, protective or, or airway adjuncts, but you should give them antidotes um, 
Uh, I guess there's a possibility that they've been a low output state rather than truly arrested for a period of time. But ultimately, if they haven't been treated, they will get respiratory muscle paralysis and die of a hypoxic arrest. So it'll be a respiratory arrest followed by cardiac arrest. Okay, thank you. Andrew, about uh, how to... Uh... Uh, the administration of uh, atropine when uh, we have to deal with a chemical uh, agent uh, introduces uh, more than uh, intravenous? Again, it depends on the setting. So in the military setting, we would potentially use um, intraosseous, um, but I think you use whatever, whatever, you're con whatever you are familiar with. Um, so for paramedics, it may be that they'd be happy using intraosseous needles, or it may be that um, cannula is fine. Um, if if you have auto injectors, actually that's probably the best route. Um, it's the simplest. It's intramuscular or auto injector into the thigh. Thank you. Okay, for the nuclear weapons, you told us uh, obviously that. Uh, um, Hospitals will be uh, will prob would probably be destroyed um, as the civilian buildings. But uh, what about we we heard that uh, many people tried to to buy some uh, iodine pills uh, for preventive um, uh, possible uh, effect. Uh, is it useful? Do do military uh, militaries uh, take it? So, that, so iodine iodine is useful if you're potentially going to be exposed to some of the radioactive iodine isotopes. So they occur after weapons accidents. So if your nuclear submarine goes on fire, or your nuclear reactor goes on fire, potentially will release some iodine um, um, isotopes. And so some of the radioactive fallout from a nuclear weapon explosion will have iodine as well as other radioisotopes. So iodine is potentially useful. Um, and the um, expectation is that if people take iodine before or immediately after the event, um, it will reduce the risk of thyroid cancer a bit. Um, there's some groups of patients where it might not be advisable. So people who have autoimmune thyroid disease and so on, it might um, make things worse. Um, so it's meant to be on a on a case by case basis for patients who've got pre-existing thyroid disease. Okay. Uh, another question just came uh, in the chat box. Uh, do we use uh, benzodiazepines only if seizures um, happen, or? We do you do we use it uh, prophylactically? So you shouldn't need them unless the patient's having a seizure or is extremely um, agitated. Um, and again, you don't want to. If you've got lots of patients, you don't want to convert people who are looking after themselves to people who are potentially going to have airway problems after getting too much benzodiazepine when they didn't need it. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't know if we have any other question. Uh, maybe uh, you, you showed us uh, some Ed memoirs, and I thank you for this French word. <laughs> uh, how can we... Um, Read them and... So the aid memoirs are on the National Health Service um, emergency preparedness page. So you can Google uh, NHS emergency preparedness and the aid memoirs are there. Um, okay, and uh, I think it would be extremely useful for uh, our colleagues uh, all around the world. Um, Maybe we can conclude just uh, maybe to by summarizing some five uh, key messages to leave to our uh, attendees. Uh, yeah. Is it okay for you? Uh, Absolutely. So I guess that yeah. the first thing is that you should think about um, the toxidromes involved, particularly the nerve agent toxidrome, which is different from things that we normally see. Um, 
in our, in our civilian practice. Um, the second thing is that decontamination is very effective and there's very good evidence on this um, from research work. So removing the casualties clothing will remove 90% of the contamination for most agents and then showering them will remove nearly everything else. And that applies to most chemical agents um, and to um, radioactive dust and so on as well. Um, I guess the third thing would be that you need to think about this before it happens and make sure that your hospital major incident plans incorporate the possibility of chemical weapons attack. Um, and someone in your hospital knows how to deal with things like radiological dispersal devices. Um, most medium to large hospitals will have people who can do that. You've got uh, radiation physicists um, who are used to dealing with radiation um, and dealing with radioisotopes and can work um, radiation counters and so on. Um, and then, uh, I think that's probably the three main things. I can't think of any more. <laughs> I think it's perfect. Uh, Jacques, do you want to, to conclude uh, this webinar? Yes, thank you, Sami, and uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, it was very uh, clear talk and uh, uh, very important uh, messages, uh, and I hope that uh, uh, it, it, it will be uh, useful for uh, our uh, Ukrainian colleagues. colleagues. And uh, once again, uh, it just... Uh, uh, I, I hope that this uh, webinar is yes, uh, it's a more small things to support uh, uh, our colleagues, uh, but uh, we are deeply with them in our mind and uh, uh, very impressed by uh, their courage and uh, uh, and uh, we we think a lot of, uh, of them and uh, thank you, Sami, thank you, Andrew. Uh, for your support. Yes. Thank you. And so, unfortunately, this was the the last uh, of uh, the last one of this uh, webinar series uh, on war trauma injury management. Um, so we hope that uh, you will get uh, very useful uh, uh, information. And Andrew, I thank you uh, for uh, we learned uh, many many things. Uh, and so uh, thank you everyone, thank you for uh, the ESIGM, uh, for this uh, support and uh, for the organization, technical um, organization and uh, everything. Courage to everyone. Thanks a lot. Have a good uh, afternoon. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. Goodbye everyone.